across Europe, while also promoting the mobility of apprentices, apprenticeships. These aims are promoted through national commitments as well as voluntary pledges from stakeholders. Now, today, um, it's really exciting because we have a packed agenda with contribution from uh, a CEDEFOP expert, distinguished panelists, and an apprenticeship uh, apprentice who has won the World Skills Olympics. Before we start, just a few housekeeping rules. Uh, the microphone and camera will be turned off at all time. And uh, we do encourage you to use the chat uh, to leave comments and interact with other participants uh, during the event. And of course, also to react to things that have that is uh, that is being said throughout the event. We want this event to be lively and dynamic um, and to have your questions uh, raised throughout it. We will also have a Q&A um, at the end in case we do not have time or the occasion to bring this up uh, throughout our conversations. Uh, please note also that the event will be recorded, um, so that's that's good to keep in mind. Uh, now I would like to introduce Anna Carrero, who is the Deputy Head of Unit at GG Ample in charge of Vets and Apprenticeships. Um, she will be extending a warm welcome to all of you and set the stage for today's event. So I'd leave the floor to you, Anna. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Nicolas, and good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to EAFA's webinar on a journey to sustainability, the role of apprenticeships in supporting uh, tourism and hospitality. So I just uh, I will just share some words to frame the conversation uh, before leaving the floor to Nicolas and uh, the rest of the speakers. Um, in today's event, we will talk about the tourism and hospitality sector in the EU and, and the role of apprenticeships. The relevance is very clear. Uh, we are talking about 10% of the EU GDP coming from this sector and also 20 million people uh, employed. It went through a lot of challenges lately. Uh, it stayed resilient uh, through many of those, uh, particularly the COVID-19 pandemic that entailed a temporary sharp decline in, in tourism, but it also brought more sustainable travel trends. Now some travelers uh, have been adopting greener options and are more aware of the environment, um, they are traveling closer to home and uh, avoiding crowded destinations and, and seeking more authentic experiences. Other challenges have emerged, uh, like the current uh, workforce uh, shortages that affect uh, the, this, this sector uh, in particular, among others, and also the, the lower qualifications of its workers uh, compared to, to other sectors. So uh, around two thirds of SMEs uh, said very recently that they cannot find the talent they need. And the situation has been worsening over the years uh, due to demographic decline, higher demands for the green and digital transition and challenges related to, to working conditions uh, in certain areas. So with this in mind, the commission has been uh, working on it and has launched a series of initiatives to address the situation. Last year, in May, uh, we launched the European Year of Skills. Uh, the idea was to change the mindset uh, towards upskilling and reskilling and step up efforts in this area by all relevant stakeholders. So we wanted really to encourage people, policymakers, companies, and uh, to work together on this front and uh, have more and better investments, make skills more relevant to labor market needs, uh, but also match people's aspirations, uh, in particular in view of the digital and green transitions, and when needed, also attract uh, talent uh, from abroad. On this note, just to remind you that we will be closing the year on the 30th of April. Uh, there will be an event taken stock of what has been done and reflecting on the future. So I encourage you all to, to stay tuned and, and follow online. And very recently, another big initiative to address some of the challenges that affect the sector, it's uh, the um, action plan on labor and skill shortages that we launched on the 20th of uh, March, uh, together with member states and social partners uh, to, to address these challenges. So um, the action plan uh, has like five uh, areas of um, uh, action. The first one would be supporting the activation of underrepresented uh, groups in the labor market. Second one, of course, providing support for skills development. And here, apprenticeships, we consider 
as, as very relevant because of the, the close link with the labor market. And then, of course, other areas like improving working conditions, but also uh, internal mobility and attracting uh, talent uh, from abroad. So the webinar comes very timely. Uh, we will explore how apprenticeships can support the sector, tourism and hospitality sector uh, in addressing these challenges, but also seizing the opportunities of the green and digital transition. And with this, I give the floor back to Nicolas and I wish you a very fruitful discussion. Thank you so much, Anna, for this insightful introduction. Indeed, I think the tourism and hospitality sector is, is a sector that is close to, to the heart for, for most of us when we go on holiday and you know have time off. And at the same time, it's a very um, important sector uh, economically uh, as well. And that's, that's a transition to our next item on the agenda. Um, and I will now uh, hand over the floor to uh, Jiri Branca, who is uh, a CIRP of expert in the Department for Vet and Skills. Um, and he leads Skills Intelligence Project um, and works with Skills Intelligence Products and Visualizations. He's been previously at ILO, so uh, we are um, in good hands uh, to tackle this uh, subject. Uh, Jiri, I leave the floor to you. Uh, thank you very much, Nicholas. You're, you're very kind. If you don't mind, I will share my slides from my side because there are some animations. So. Uh, uh, so I don't have to instruct you when exactly to press press the buttons. So uh, just a moment, I will set it up on my side. Uh, and yeah, so I hope I hope now you can all uh, see my screen. Uh, thank you for this very kind invitation. I would like to say in the beginning that I am actually joining uh, uh, the CEDEFOP apprenticeship team, and I'm moving from the skills intelligence, uh, you know, part of CEDEFOP, uh, of CEDEFOP's work. Uh, but uh, my presentation still uh, will be taking the, the the viewpoint of my, uh, let's say, current or and, and previous uh, CEDEFOP expertise, which is in uh, looking at labor market trends and, and skill needs. And so with that, uh, I uh, would like to start. And now, Niklas, you can support me with uh, with the poll question. And the poll question is that how many workers will be needed, do you think will be needed to fill available jobs in tourism and hospitality until 2035? And there are three options. One is that it's over 2 million. The second one is over 5 million. And the third one is over 7 million. So, uh, you know, this is... Uh, I will get back to the to the answer uh, later on. So uh, you know, think and uh, uh, share with us your your opinions on that. Uh, so uh, so I will start uh, with basically saying what what employment and skills data can we have on on the tourism sector, and uh, when looking what is available uh, mostly from uh, Eurostat official statistics, but also from Cerefops work. Which includes, Union which includes the forecasting of, of the skills. In, uh... I, I see someone talking. Can you please mute yourself? Thank you. Uh, so it's basically four categories. The, the, the core of the, the employment of the sector is either in food service uh, and or accommodation, meaning, meaning basically hotels and restaurants, and also travel agencies. And there is also the transportation sector, but unfortunately, it is only the air travel where we can kind of discern, uh, you know, the, the the employment in areas that are related to tourism, while in other sections of the transport sector, like uh, road or uh, or water transport, it's the majority of people working as yes, are not related to to, to tourism. Uh, so we will not include these subsections in the data that I will be sharing with you. And, and when you look at uh, when you look at the uh, deployment chart, you also see that it's the food service and accommodation that uh, are basically employing most of people that are related to tourism and hospitality. Uh, and some smaller part, uh, the numbers are in, in thousands, by the way, are employed in travel agencies or, or air travel. And so overall, it is roughly about 10 million people. This is based on uh, Eurostat a labor force survey, which is a survey that asks workers, you know, where, and what, where they work and what they do. Uh, there are some uh, other employment data on tourism that come from uh, organization survey, but I choose uh, the employment uh, survey because it provides the most recent data, which actually covers the year 2023. 
so looking at the trends, uh, it is slightly less, the implement is slightly less than it was a prior COVID-19. Uh, the comparison is based on the fourth quarter of 2023 versus the fourth quarter of 2019, but also uh, it's not a, a really big, really big difference. And uh, as I will explain later on, the employment in the sector has been improving and is uh, expected to improve in the future as well. So, so when you look at uh, the comparison of uh, of the employment trends uh, of of now uh, versus the the BC before COVID period, you see that uh, in the in the food service there is actually an increase of employment. But in the other three parts of uh, what we recognize as a hospitality and tourism sector, there is still uh, many jobs less than they were before COVID, with uh, the, the biggest uh, drop still being observed in, in travel services sector. And uh, translating the percentages into, into number of jobs, uh, every icon represents roughly 10,000 jobs. You see that in, in the food service, we have approximately uh, more than 100,000 people more employed than, than before COVID. But uh, in the other uh, parts of the tourism sector, there is a still a significant uh, a job gap, uh, roughly 150,000 workers less in accommodation and also in uh, travel service industry with and some 40,000 jobs still being uh, missing in, in the air travel. Uh, just to, to give you a short illustration of what actually happening during COVID, you see uh, you know, each color uh, indicates a year to year change. So uh, I, I meant some really bad with colors. So I, I would call the first one kind of a light brown, possibly. Uh, so you see that there was, of course, the, this biggest drop uh, uh, compared to the all COVID period, because uh, this was was the type of the first lockdown and really difficult situation also in the job market. Uh, in some sectors like in air travel and travel agencies, the employment drop continued also in the year after in 2021, but then uh, we see some improvements and even with the travel agencies, which I said was the worst hit part of the tourism sector, you see a gradual impo improvement. And uh, so even in uh, the sectors, where we see the biggest uh, job loss compared to pre-COVID period, there is a good trend and development to erase all losses. Uh, now, CEDEFOP does its own uh, skills forecast, which is actually employment forecast. We don't deal with future demands for skills. We use occupations as, as proxy for skills. And, and you can see that uh, basically across all the tourism and hospitality, CEDEFOP for, foresees a si substantial um, uh, increase in, in employment. Uh, you may say that 11 or 13 percent is not substantial, but we are also facing a situation where Europe is going to have less and less workers uh, because of the demographic challenge. So such increase is actually extremely uh, positive uh, for the prospects of the, of the tourism and hospitality sector. These uh, increases, these percentage increases mean that basically by 2035, we should have some million and 300,000 more jobs in tourism and hospitality than we had in 2021. And uh, what is even more important is that this is actually a small part of, of the job demand on the employer side, because uh, we not only have uh, new jobs being created within tourism and hospitality sector, we also have many workers leaving the sector uh, for various reasons mainly for retirement, but also moving to work in other sectors or uh, being uh, going to economic inactivity, for example, when, when people take parental leave. So when you uh, uh, imagine that you are an average um, you know, hospitality establishment and you have 100 employees, so it is expected that in 2035 you will have 30 new jobs created, but of the 100 that used to have, 62 people will leave and you will have to replace them. So it's a huge amount uh, of, of, of jobs uh, available to uh, to people to fill in in the tourism and hospitality, and it will uh, it will be one of the major challenges that the sector is going to face in next years. Now, uh, aside from forecast, CEDEFOP also uh, surveys skills, and uh, we have 
recently, meaning a year and a half ago, uh, presented the outcomes of our employer uh, employee skill survey, which is called European Skills and Job Survey, when we ask workers about their skills, about access to training and other things. So uh, to sum it up, uh, what it says about, about tourism and hospitality. Uh, so the share of workers who report great upskilling needs, meaning kind of indicating that their jobs are, are significantly changing uh, and they need new skills, is not is actually second lowest of all sectors. It kind of indicates that not very many workers see their tasks and, and uh, jobs changed uh, over time. Uh, but uh, we also uh, see that uh, there is actually a high share of workers who report that they need social skills upskilling, and this is 55% of the workforce, and it's actually the third highest of all sectors. And uh, some 40% workers uh, also uh, report that they have higher education level than what is the job required, which means that at least part of their skills is not fully utilized in their workplaces. Uh, we have been discussing also that these two transitions, the digital and green one, are affecting employment across all sectors. It's no difference for tourism and hospitality. Uh, we can see in our data that uh, more than one third of workers already in the tourism and hospitality sector use digital devices for work. And almost half of them, uh, uh, this is a wrong number, I don't, uh, okay. But 40% uh, of them, almost 40% uh, reported change task because of digitalization. Uh, so because of that, uh, almost one third of workers report digital skills training needs and uh, roughly one, in 10 uh, workers in hospitality and tourism sector say that they have really big digital upskilling needs because the job requires that. Uh, regarding uh, the training provision, uh, it could be probably better because uh, if you even if you ignore the, the percentages on the left side, you see that basically when it comes to training provision, uh, tourism and hospitality uh, is uh, one of the lowest and worst performing sectors of, of all, all sectors in, in European economy. And this is definitely something that uh, is important to focus on more in the future because of the challenges I mentioned I mentioned earlier. That is an access to, uh, to more skills analysis data uh, that is available in one of the set of online tools. Now, uh, back to future employment trends in tourism and hospitality sector. So uh, almost half of the workers in the sector uh, can we, we call them personal services workers. Uh, and these uh, go from cooks, waiters, bartenders, but also travel attendants. The CERFOP expects that there will be small employment growth uh, of these jobs in, uh, in the future, and they have also decent future employment prospects. Uh, it's a big category, so just a flavor of what is actually included. Uh, you see that uh, most of them, the most important ones are three categories, which are cooks, uh, waiters, and bartenders, each category having a 30% share of employment in this larger group. And you also see that uh, when you look at uh, the, the employment trends, we see some significant decrease for waiters and bartenders, but rising employment for basically every other category. Uh, CEDEFOP also did uh, some recent analysis uh, on this occupation. Uh, links are provided here and you can access them from the presentation that will be shared afterwards. Uh, another big job area in uh, tourism and hospitality is administration. And there CEDEFOP foresees significant uh, increase in, in basically two occupation groups. One is the business administration roles, which are people who do marketing, but also finance and HR and also legal, social, and culture roles. Again, this is a big, big um, aggregation of, of jobs that go for, uh, in, in, let's say, large scope. They include artists, fitness people, interior designers, but also chefs who, strangely enough, in occupation categories are not regarded as cooks. Uh, in other roles that, that we have in the tourism and hospitality, uh, most important is the food service support staff, which is, uh, people who uh, support cooks, but we have also uh, uh, people who uh, 
uh, a kind of uh, supporting the, the food service. You have food processing trays. These are people like butchers and also farmers and related workers. And this is one of the things that we can observe in the employment data in tourism and hospitality already, that you have these, uh, for example, for agro-tourism and uh, uh, things related to that, uh, this is the reason why we, for example, see and, and, and also foresee the rising employment of, of people who do farming and, and, and the related stuff. Then uh, some small increase we expect for other category, which is which I aggregate as support client service stuff. It includes sales workers, but also customer clerks and so you know customer service people. And then uh, small but increasing area of of, uh, of services provided by tourism and hospitality, which is related to teaching, training, and so on. Because we have this aging problem across European economy, and we expect that the average age of uh, of people and also users of tourism services will rise. There is a substantial forecast with increase of the need for healthcare staff in the sector, ranging from healthcare assistants, which include physiotherapists, but also doctors and nurses. So this area so, uh, so far quite small is going to increase significantly. Uh, the same basically is true for what I call here advanced maintenance staff, which is ICT people, but also technicians, engineers and construction electrician roles, uh, which provide uh, you know, this kind of advanced maintenance. Uh, the other category that uh, the other categories are, are kind of smaller in importance, but because of the overall uh, rising employment trend in tourism and hospitality, they will also um, create more jobs in the future. To sum it up, and we have some overall future trends. So in some categories ranging from business administration staff and legal, social and cultural staff, these are those lawyers, arti lawyers artists, designers, chefs and fitness people, healthcare staff and, and people around ICT and, and technicians are going to increase significantly in employment in tourism in the future. Uh, the food service support stuff, but also drivers, mechanics and vehicle support stuff, we expect some moderate increase. And uh, this overall new job creation is still, as I said, a small part of the story because over 6 million workers are needed to fill in vacated jobs until 2035, mainly for core service areas. So going back to the question I asked in the beginning, how many jobs uh, uh, will be needed to fill in tourism in the future? And that the right option was the last one over 7 million because it puts together the new creation and the replacement needs. What is kind of troubling is that in the skill survey that we did, we have also asked about job satisfaction and tourism and hospitality workers report the lowest job satisfaction across all economic sectors. And this is maybe one of the reasons why the sector will may struggle in the future uh, to fill in the vacated jobs that will be plentiful. Uh, Skill needs so far, they don't seem to change much, but training access, as I mentioned, is an issue and it is really one of the things that uh, the, the sector needs to focus more because of the expected skill shortages and need to utilize the, the skills of existing workers much better. Uh, there is also uh, employment and skills data on the sector, which is available in one of our online tools. And I think uh, you know there are some publications that we did recently and I think that I already exceeded my time, so I will stop here and I'll thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I will be happy to respond in the chat. Thank you. Thank you so, thank you so much, Yuri. It was quite a cliffhanger there with the with the poll as well that it was it was seven million, and it was also a very useful breakdown I found between these uh, sectors: air travel, food service, accommodation, and travel agencies. I think it helps us also in the upcoming discussions to to think about this sector, uh, not just as one of them, but to consider. To consider all those sectors and as well as the professions uh, professions that you that you mentioned. So thank you so much, Ira. It was it was very interesting. Um, now I will move on to uh, introduce our distinguished panel panelists, which we are very happy to welcome. Um, I just uh, I might make some error here with the pronunciation of your names. So in in I apologize in advance. So we first have uh, Lina Saltampasi who is the, the CEO of the Ocon Group since 2003. She holds an MBA from the University of Macedonia and is a PhD candidate. She's certified in consulting services and actively supports women's uh, entrepreneurship, serving as president of the Greek Association of Women Entrepreneurs as well uh, since 2008. 
Next, we have uh, Virgin uh, de Macron, who is uh, Tourism Sector Political Secretary at the European Federation of Food, Agriculture, Tourism tr uh, and Trade Unions, um, EFAT, as you might know them as. They're an umbrella organization of 116 trade unions from 37 European countries, so going beyond the EU27. And they defend the interests of more than 25 million workers. Uh, Virgin is a labor lawyer by background um, and has experience from working at a uh, French trade union as the head of the legal department. Then last but certainly not least, we, we have Lajos uh, Boroc. And he's the Secretary General of Vimos. Um, they represent the employers of uh, 140,000 employees. He coordinates the Hungarian Sectoral National Skills Group, uh, developing training and tools and resources to meet tourism sector's um, evolving skills needs. Lakos is also active at the EU level. Um, he has been engaged in various European projects and groups uh, involving Next Tourism Generation, um, Together for EU Tourism, uh, Business Europe Education and Training Working Group. So I think I got everything. <laughs> um, with the panel presented, uh, I will begin by giving the floor to Lina. Um, so I would like to invite uh, your intervention and perhaps you could tell us more about how your organization works with apprenticeships in the area of sustainability. Thank you. I hand over to you, Lina. Thank you very much, Nicholas. And I'd like to thank also the European Alliance for Apprenticeships uh, that uh, hosted me here in this very, uh, in this excellent panel. And uh, it is very uh, welcoming having such uh, organizations that uh, deep dive a little bit into uh, the world of market, actually, because here we have a great combination about uh, the theoretical part, the research part, but also the market. So uh, here today I'm invited as a representative of Green Host uh, project, which is a project related to skills, which is, as we said, the year of the skills, uh, which is uh, just about to end, but also the world of apprenticeship uh, and how this is linked in the touristic sector and uh, with the sustainability method. The full title of the project is Vocational Excellence Policy and Enterprise United for Hospitality Management Skills Adapted on Environmental Footprint Methods, and the acronym is Greenhouse. Our project has just started one month ago, so somebody might say, why this lady is here with just one month of project? Because this project is a result of, of extensive research in the market needs that we are having in the touristic sector. So we have partners from 19, uh, 19 partners from several countries. All these countries are very much into the touristic sector. Greece, Bulgaria, Cyprus, Italy, Spain, Slovenia, and Portugal with a 2.5 approximately uh, budget of EU contribution. And we are targeting hospitality management, tourism management, organizational management students, and work learners for, 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 for the range of EQF levels from three to eight. So here in this project, we are combining uh, um, uh, uh, lesser levels of EQF with more levels of EQF and also market uh, stakeholders to identify the needs uh, and to bridge the needs with the market and actually the training. So most of the organization have been working five years pro-COVID during COVID and after COVID in identifying from their side what is the needs and how we can tackle them and how we can go forward. If we can have the next one, please. So, uh, as you can see, we have uh, partners from tertiary level, from Greece, Spain, Portugal, and Cyprus, but also intermediary level from Greece, Bulgaria, Italy, Spain, and Slovenia, and also the market factor, the market stakeholders that they are the ones that bring on the demand to the market, and this is really important. So the Green Host project aims to cover a large area of the neighborhood country, and we will uh, we have. Uh, done our best to invite relevant partners and uh, cover all the aspects that are needed uh, with one uh, clear uh, vision in order to be able to uh, cover party 
part of the gap because you cannot cover a 7 million um, employee gap, of course, uh, to the touristic sector with what is needed in the new era uh, related to green uh, skills and sustainability. If we can go to the next one, please. So the major identified needs that we were having is the shortage of skill staff, unfortunately, because uh, a lot of people in the touristic sector find it as a short term career option. Uh, let's say, especially in the southern part of Europe, they identified it as a living uh, just uh, method and not as a long term career. So according to the HOGA and the EFAT, Recruiting and retaining a skilled workforce is the sector's biggest challenge. And one of the reasons is that the young people do not see this sector as attractive employment anymore. But today, the sector is definitely growing again. And it is in need of a new workforce for creating digital and green skills for high value jobs in hospitality management and circular economy. And it is our duty to pass this message that. The touristic sector, which is, as um, our colleague said, uh, the 10% of GDP of Europe, it's not just a temporary uh, work choice. It's a career choice that can provide really uh, well-paid and uh, a higher value uh, job positions. And also the challenge of becoming green into tourism, which is based on a recent study from Adedoyen and Beckin. Um, the tourism industry, which includes hotels and the hospitality industry in general, as well as the transportation and food and beverage industries related to them, is a major contribution to greenhouse gas emissions that lead to climate change. It is now clear that all implicated stakeholders need to be addressed. And so, when we are discussing about green entrepreneurship anymore, which is the new trend, and we are discussing about the Green Deal, and we are discussing about green transition, we cannot exclude the touristic sector. And touristic sector is not only the entrepreneurs themselves or the management, it's all the circle of the chain of the employees, because the touristic sector relies a lot on employability and on, on, and on employees, while other sectors might uh, host more solopreneurs or really, really micro businesses with one or two employees. The touristic sector includes uh, usually um, uh, a bigger number of employees. So uh, relying on green strategies and green transitional businesses without training our employees is not something that it would be viable for the future. May I have the next one, please? So the key points that we are working on this project is bring hosts objective to create and recognize a modern bank curriculum in order to train the staff working in the tourism and hospitality management sector and to be implemented through in apprenticeship, internship and work-based learning in direct li uh, liaison with the industry. Also to promote sustainable entrepreneurship through startups and incubation initiative, as well as entrepreneurial skills and competencies among the workforce and the sector students and graduates as part of lifelong learning. In this point, we identified that some of our trainers are going to be our next colleagues in entrepreneurship. So they're not going only to be uh, included in the workforce's employees, but there might be the, the future employers, the future entrepreneurs. So we are we have designed also a model of for the ones that would like to uh, go forward from the employee status to the uh, entrepreneurial status and support them with a, a, a vivid incubation uh, initiative. And the setup, of course, of the entrepreneurship and transnational mobility scheme that will be established by uh, Greenhost through an online transnational cooperation platform that will be tested in practice, improved where needed, and implemented regularly with the goal being to produce sustainable relationships and results that will be maintained, of course, after the course of the project. Why apprentices are so important in our sector? Imagine being in the middle of the season. Imagine being in a Greek island or a Spanish island in August and somebody just quits. So having lack already of uh, employees, having lack of staff and somebody quits because it's too much for him or her. So apprenticeship is a good tool for, for both sides to identify 
if this is suitable for for the person to be employed in the sector and for the um, uh, for the employer to identify is this person uh, is um, able to go into his permanent workforce from the next season so in all of course sectors the principle are really important but especially to uh, 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 um, sector that relies so much on personnel and not that much in, in machinery, not that much in the effort of the entrepreneurs themselves, uh, and also has a seasonality, it's more than welcome to have people that have been already trained in situ and they have identified that this is an, a career option and not just, you know, trying themselves if they can they can survive the season or not, which is not something that we want. Uh, also, from a humanitarian point of view, we don't want people that would be suffering during the season, but people that would identify uh, uh, the sector and the industry that they have come to. So uh, this is more or less a project that bridges the needs for for employment, the needs for employability, the needs for entrepreneurship, the green transition, but also supporting with skills, uh, uh, with uh, skills uh, uh, people that we tender this very flourishing industry uh, of the European economy. Thank you for the. Thank you so much, Lina. It was it was very interesting, and I have a follow up question, if I may. Um, I, I'm I'm curious about what you interpret sustainability as, and what you see green skills to be. Uh, it could be, we we sometimes interpret this uh, as as it could be waste management. It could be about other sustainable practices. So what 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 is your interpretation of sustainability and green skills? It is all of them together. I mean, I mean, it's not one specific, depends on the position that you're going to work in the touristic industry. Uh, the, and the sustainability also comes uh, to people themselves. I mean, uh, the sustainability of, of the business going beyond just material issues, but, uh, but um, touching also uh, people on that. Mm -hmm. So uh, food waste, energy efficiency, um, uh, um, being more uh, up to to the point when you're doing your business, being more accurate in the way you're doing the business, following the specific model that would be more sustainable for the future is all together. But it comes to different levels because tourism has it's it's a wide sector it has um our colleague uh giri um mentioned four pillars let's say uh, four subsectors but in every subsector especially in the food industry and in the hospitality industry there are so many different positions so you cannot train everybody in everything it will be a very focused curriculum based on the subsector and also based on the position. Of course, some general knowledge should be there. I mean, about food waste. We were uh, having some research before coming to this proposal with some five-star hotels and about the food waste in the in the uh, breakfast uh, buffet. Um, this helped us to um, to design the project. This is general knowledge, more or less, for everybody in the in the sector. But it's not something that something that we we're going to teach. Something that is working outdoors is not the same to somebody working indoors or vice versa. Indeed, thank you for sharing your perspective. It's, you. I think we could continue uh, for a long time, but we have other speakers lined up as well who we are very curious to hear uh, from. Uh, we will now turn to Virginie. Um, who is representing EAFAT at the EU level. Uh, Virginie, could you could you let us know how, how you are working on promoting green apprenticeships? Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. So first of all, thank you for giving me the opportunity to participate in this panel and give the point of view of workers in tourism. Um, so it was uh, already mentioned, but uh, I have to maybe to, to remind that the tourism sector is a particular sector regarding the workforce specificity. Uh, it is a, a, a sector that provides many first working experience to the youth and we have 19% of workers in the sector uh, under 25 years old. Uh, it is also a sector that employs a high share of women, of uh, migrant workers 
and it was also mentioned uh, uh, relatively unskilled workers. 30% uh, of the workers in the sector hold a lower secondary educational level or less uh, compared to uh, 16 in the overall economy. Um, so we all know that on-the-job training is a norm for many occupations in the hospitality sector and uh, hand-hands is crucial if you want to become a cook, of course. Uh, and the proportion of apprentices in uh, the hospitality sector is quite uh, high compared to, to other sectors. Uh, so we are a European trade union federation and why are we involved in the promotion of apprenticeships? Uh, because in many, many member states, uh, social partners uh, plays a, a very important role in, uh, in the governance and uh, design of apprenticeship. Uh, it is common uh, to have uh, sectoral professional committees uh, with equal numbers of employer and trade union representatives. And uh, these joint committees are responsible uh, for determining and uh, updating uh, dipl diplomas and programs, uh, accrediting employers, uh, determining apprentices' wages and uh, working conditions, uh, monitoring the quality of apprenticeship training. Um, so yesterday I was just to give you a, a very uh, a very uh, recent example, but I was talking to to one of uh, of our Austrian affiliates, and he just told me uh, vocational edu educational training uh, in Austria would just not exist without social partners. Uh, so. That's why we, we are convinced that uh, promoting apprenticeship is, uh, and VET huh, is crucial, uh, but we need uh, to make sure that uh, we are talking about uh, a quality apprenticeships. Uh, and for us as trade unions, it's very important uh, to avoid uh, the replacement of workers. So apprenticeship, it's not cheap labor for us. Very important to mention that at the very beginning. And that's why we are fighting at, uh, at EU level, but also global level for quality and uh, effective apprenticeship. Um, maybe you, you are all aware of the, of the Council recommendation of 15 March uh, 2018 on the on a European framework for quality and effective apprenticeship. But we have also a, a more recent uh, recommendation from uh, ILO on uh, quality apprenticeship. It was adopted in June 2023. And it goes beyond uh, the EU uh, recommendation um, because it's more recent, I think. Uh, and we have uh, there um, detailed recommendations on the scope uh, of apprenticeship, the, the, the regulatory framework, uh, the protection of apprenticeship and equality, diversity, and also the promotion, of course, of uh, quality apprenticeships. So uh, for us, uh, what are the criteria for quality apprenticeship? First, it must lead to national recognized qualifications. Uh, quality of learning must be ensured. Qualitative working conditions must be ensured. And for that, we need to have an accreditation procedure for employer um, employing apprentices. We need to have the supervision of the apprentice by a competent in-company trainer. We need to have the payment uh, or financial compensation for the work-based component. And of course, social, uh, social protection, uh, the need that uh, um, apprentices are entitled to holidays, uh, sick pays, uh, maternity uh, leaves, paternity leaves. Uh, and of course, um, I think uh, we, we really have to pay attention to the protection uh, regarding health and safety, uh, because apprentices are um, more vulnerable and more subject to sexual harassment, for example, and to psychological risks. And we, we have also uh, to pay attention to addiction problems, so alcohol, drugs that are uh, unfortunately a reality in some sectors, in, in bars, for example, or in restaurants. And uh, this problem particularly affects uh, young workers. So uh, to make apprenticeship attra uh, attractive, it is also important to, to raise awareness of benefit and value among employers, but also among trade unions and employees. And uh, we regularly uh, discuss the benefit of apprenticeship internally with, uh, with our affiliates uh, involved in the, in, the, in the governance and the implementation of apprenticeship schemes. Um, we also coordinate at EFAT uh, European Work Council. It is also a, a good place uh, to promote uh, apprenticeship in uh, larger companies. And of course, uh, very important uh, um, through uh, or through EU social dialogue um, with uh, with our counterpart Otrek, uh, the promotion of apprenticeship uh, is very high on our agenda, and it's part of uh, of our work program for many many years. 
for example, we regularly ask uh, Otrek and EFAT affiliates uh, to present existing apprenticeship systems at meetings at our sectoral social dialogue committees. Uh, we had, for example, a presentation of the Swedish, the Irish, German, Belgium uh, example in, uh, in, uh, in previous meetings. Uh, in November 2023, we have organized a joint event uh, with Otrek uh, to promote skills and, uh, and quality apprenticeship. Uh, we, we have invited also uh, Yiri Branca uh, at this event. I don't know if you remember. Uh, and this event was really to, to do, the occasion. <laughs> Thanks, Yiri. Yeah. The, it was really the occasion to underline the importance of uh, reskilling and upskilling and uh, really to convey the message that uh, uh, skills and VET and apprenticeships are relevant uh, for uh, the um, labor market needs, uh, but also workers' employability and, of course, the viability of uh, hospitality uh, business. And during this event, we have had a very interesting presentation from uh, from Yeri, and uh, but also a very concrete conc uh, concrete example uh, of uh, social partners, uh, so both employer and trade unions uh, on a VET system existing in uh, in different uh, uh, country. Uh, very recently, we have signed a joint declaration with Otrek. It was in uh, March 2024. Uh, it was already mentioned a lot, but uh, as you know, labor shortages and also skill shortages is, is an issue huh, uh, in the hospitality sector. It's not new. It's, it, it, it is an issue for many years, uh, probably because uh, the tourism sector has grown a lot in uh, recent decades because people spent more money on leisure than before. They, they eat uh, out more than before and uh, more people go on holiday, which, which is a good news. Uh, but uh, apparently the hospitality educational sector has not adapted itself uh, sufficiently to this new uh, reality. And a lot of workers left the sector during the pandemic. Uh, and it's quite clear that uh, the recovery was uncertain. Uh, and uh, for, for a lot of workers, it was not uh, acceptable uh, to, to stay in, uh, working in, uh, in this sector. Uh, so today, then, as a consequence, the sector is facing uh, severe labor shortages. Uh, which is detrimental not only for business, um, but also for workers, because uh, they are subject to a strong workload and a high pressure. Uh, and we have discussed uh, with Otrek uh, on how to overcome um, these labor shortages and, uh, and uh, ski shortages. Uh, and we could find consensus, not on uh, all solutions, uh, because for us as trade unions, it's clear that we need uh, to improve working conditions and uh, uh, very interesting uh, to see uh, in, year, in uh, Yiri's uh, presentation that uh, the job satisfaction rate is the lowest. I think it's it's uh, really important to 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 look at this. Um, but we, we we couldn't find uh, some common solution with uh, with Otrek. Uh, and first of all, the, the promotion of social dialogue and uh, collective bargaining, uh, which is key. Um, social partners uh, know very well the situation in the sector. They are uh, committed to fair and comprehensive negotiations, and they are best placed to find uh, tailor-made solutions to attractive pay and uh, working conditions. So often, uh, through collective ag uh, agreements, you, you really can find a uh, good solution for, for, for workers uh, regarding uh, a time organization, uh, the possibility uh, to, 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 to to, to solve some health and, uh, and safety issue, for example. Uh, the promotion of, uh, of education and training uh, is also crucial uh, because of the high turnover uh, in the sector. It's, uh, it's one of the big, uh, big challenges in the sector and uh, the difficulties and to retain uh, skilled uh, workers. Uh, so in our declaration, and uh, I, I invite you to, to have a look at it because it's a, it's a very long declaration. I'm just, uh, I'm just uh, explaining a few points on that, but we recommend uh, to implement apprenticeship schemes in countries where they do not exist. And of course, to promote and improve uh, apprenticeship in, uh, in other countries. Um, one, one very important concern we share with Otrek is to ensure that uh, the green and digital transition uh, will be an opportunity to create skilled jobs and uh, to offer career prospects for workers. And for example, we share the common objective of developing tourism as a year-round economic activity in order to, to reduce uh, the negative impact um, on local community. Uh, on, uh, and, and, and of course, it, it would improve the situation of, uh, 
of uh, seasonal uh, workers. Uh, and finally, we agree on the need to provide a protective framework for the mobility of third country migrant workers. Uh, it was uh, also mentioned, but uh, in the in the Commission uh, action plan to tackle labor shortages, uh, the mobility uh, is uh, mentioned in two uh, uh, in two action um, plan uh, solutions. But uh, we think that uh, social partners have really a very important role to 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 play uh, in, uh, in in the implementation of uh, uh, for example such a, such a initiative uh, as the EU talent pool and we have to to yes you have to to make uh, the best to to provide uh, a protection for for people uh, coming uh, in the sector that's uh, that's why i wanted to share with you about our common position with uh, with Otrek. Thank you so much, uh, Virginie. It was it was very interesting. Um, I see we had a we have a question from the chat. Um, Alicia asking um, after COVID, vet providers were faced with a substantial drop of of students enrollment, especially in the hospitality area. Do you do you know of any good practice practices? And um, if not, maybe it would be interesting to have your view as well on the industry before COVID and after COVID. Um, a bit like Jiri <laughs> provided us with yeah. So yeah, yeah. two it's, questions it's, in one. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it, we worked a lot on, uh, on trying to understand also the reason why uh, a lot of uh, of people have left uh, the sector. But I think that uh, the tourism sector uh, was really uh, very visible during this period because uh, everybody was aware everything was closed. And I think it was... Um, I think one of the problems is that a lot of people were also maybe undeclared or partially undeclared we have we have to mention this but uh, it's uh, it's uh, it, it, in some uh, in some restaurants we have a lot of undeclared work and i think for people it means that uh, during the covid they just received uh, financial support but based uh, not on uh, on the, the reality of uh, of uh, of what they earned before but uh, less less much, as a much less uh, and i think it was a uh, it, it is probably a, a reason explaining why, why people uh, have left the sector. Um, I have heard also, and it's interesting to mention it also, but uh, for example, in, um, in, in the UK, uh, the lack of uh, workforce in, uh, in the hospitality sector is due to Brexit uh, because uh, a lot of uh, students uh, are not, I think it was, uh, it was common that the students uh, from the EU um, just uh, went to, to the UK uh, to learn English and uh, have a little job in a restaurant or in a bar. And now it's not any, any more possible just uh, just uh, to work in uh, in the UK uh, uh, for for a student job. Um, so it is a, a specific situation in uh, in the UK, but it can explain a lot uh, the situation uh, about labor shortages uh, there. Uh, but I think in uh, in EU uh, we have still a lot of uh, of students job. Um, which is good on one side because we know that for students it's a good opportunity uh, to have a little job and uh, to earn money to 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 work on weekends. Uh, it's easier for them, uh, maybe uh, for students, easier to work on weekends than for for people having a family. So we understand that well. But uh, on the other hand, it's clear that uh, these people are not st uh, staying in the sector. Mm. And that's exactly what we we try to have uh, through apprenticeship is to have uh, people really committed. Uh, to to work in the sector. Yeah, and I'm thinking it's part of a life puzzle as well, because to make that move to become an apprenticeship in a different region or a different country, even you need to consider, you know, a holistic approach um, and take into account what they are interested in. You know, if it's about going to London or Athens or whatever, it's uh, and providing that support around them as well. So, yep. yeah, very insightful. Thank you, Virginie. Now. Uh, we go to the to the pa next panelist, uh, Lachos, and uh, you are involved both at, both at Hungarian and the EU level, so you have some unique insights, I think, uh, wearing those two two hats. So I, I give the word to you now to present. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I would like to ask for my slides, if possible. Uh, Practically, we see a little bit uh, the football European Championship because uh, here the balls uh, can be passed as we work together quite a lot with Virginia on European level. Uh, I think she has used a lot of words uh, that concern also our activities. Uh, and uh, also, I can join also uh, Yves' 
pass because he spoke about the uh, skills issue and how uh, upskilling, reskilling is considered. Uh, I also would like to uh, mention a Randstad uh, survey, which where they asked 1,000 European CEOs and 75% claimed that re upskilling would help to solve uh, workforce problems. And there was also Hungarian Randstad uh, research this among the employees, 64% uh, of them said that uh, they would really like to take part in the skills development programs. And among the young people, this share is even 89%. So uh, there are still hopes and uh, this can hopefully bring also results. And uh, still preliminary info that uh, we are a very labor intensive uh, sector with uh, unfortunately lower value added than the other sectors, the competitive sectors. As a consequence, we have these lower salaries. We were also uh, particularly hit by the great resignation of the COVID period. After COVID, we had to learn uh, how to apply the most modern HR uh, solutions in order to become competitive again. Uh, please pass with the slide. I can't see my slide, by the way. We are now at next tourism generation. OK, uh, it's OK. Uh, here I have uh, not too many minutes, so I, uh, I have prepared the slides, but I shall speak only on a very few of the words uh, in it. Uh, we have uh, tried uh, in this uh, wonderful consortium uh, applied the most modern uh, solutions with the skills assessment methodology. We have tried to identify the skills gaps and the, uh, in general the skill set uh, with the skill matrix. We have created practically a database with all the work profiles that exist in our sector and uh, with the necessary skills in the green, social and uh, digital areas for small, medium and uh, even big companies. We have also developed almost 70 uh, learning content that can be used. So uh, this structure can be used both uh, for the employees when they look for a, a better job for a possibility because they can uh, easily uh, arrive at a better job uh, uh, with learning some additional skills, so with the upskilling. And the end of this uh, uh, NTG project was the blueprint strategy, and uh, it seemed to be promising, so we could uh, directly continue with the fund to next slide, please. Its uh, result is the, the skills lab, which is a, uh, already functioning one-stop shop. So everyone who has to um, do something, who wants to know something about uh, skills possibilities in this sector, can serve uh, himself or herself uh, in this uh, lab. It is obvious that the skilled workforce is uh, necessary for us, and uh, therefore we try to make uh, uh, an even uh, more complex uh, mechanism, which is the sector skills intelligence monitor. Next slide, please. It will keep track of the skill gaps, uh, the skills needs and job profiles, uh, will share best practices, training uh, needs can be identified. Uh, they can also be addressed with the help of it. And uh, it's very important uh, that uh, advocates the collaboration uh, between all the stakeholders. Next slide, uh, please. Uh, the skills monitor will be available uh, from the autumn on, but we have already some partial results. Uh, we have made interview surveys and uh, primary and secondary research, and as a result of this research, uh, we think that uh, these will be the future uh, work profiles in our sector from 2030. Uh, and behind these uh, profiles, we shall develop learning content and uh, uh, the activities and skills uh, will be listed. And I think that this will also contribute to the elevation of the 
uh, skills level and the value adding possibility of the sector. Next slide, please. The apprenticeships are <coughs> very important vital for our sector. <coughs> because they prepare for the future. Uh, they even have to uh, teach what kind of difficulties this uh, sector can mean. And uh, this uh, helps to avoid also the early living of the sector. The skills can be learned on the job in practice and from the best practitioners uh, in case of the uh, the apprenticeships. That's why uh, we have also supported it in uh, the SOTREC effort joint uh, declaration. Uh, having spent in a good environment and having learned uh, something important, uh, it's uh, very good for the uh, employees as well because they know uh, where they fit. They know what kind of satisfaction they can mean for the clients. Uh, therefore, when they enjoy themselves uh, in their work uh, profile and environment, uh, this will definitely reduce the staff turnover. So therefore, this uh, the whole structure of the dual education, there are some good examples and some uh, worse examples. But anyway, it's a good direction, uh, but uh, definitely helps uh, uh, to handle the, this labor issue and the skills shortages. Next slide, please. Uh, apprenticeship uh, is a good solution, but uh, we can see that there are definitely challenges we have to fight. Uh, we have heard from the previous presentations that we have the demographic issues. Uh, we have less and less people available in general for the labor market. Uh, therefore, we have uh, even less young employees, less trainers, and uh, as they have uh, multitask activities, they also may have less patience, for example, uh, for the youngsters who are there uh, for their apprenticeship work. Uh, another major issue is the administrative uh, requirements. Uh, the various chambers of commerce, uh, the state, the authorities uh, may dictate here rules that can be very complicated. And this is definitely true for the uh, small and medium companies that are so characteristic for our sector. That's why many of them don't even participate in the apprenticeship uh, programs. Uh, it's really a, a big challenge for them uh, and a major HR challenge. Uh, we have also some geographic uh, issues with this uh, apprenticeship story because we can experience uh, the movement from east to west. This is valid for Romania, Hungary, Slovakia uh, as well, but we can see this whole movement. Uh, later, I shall have some illustration for this. Uh, there is also a risk uh, of the early leavers, but it can be uh, partially handled uh, with the apprenticeship. And uh, it's an experience from the NTG and the PAN tour that even if we can already identify the skills gaps, it uh, doesn't go through uh, fast enough into the education materials in the VET education or higher education. Next slide, please. Uh, apart from the challenges, there are also opportunities uh, that can open to new candidates this whole system. So if we work uh, with all the stakeholders together to reduce the administrative burden, uh, we can educate the employers uh, what is the good use of the apprenticeship uh, and we tighten the relationship uh, with the employers, education providers, and uh, of course the participants. Uh, that creates the best environment uh, for the apprenticeship. Next slide, please. We have made a small uh, survey in Hungary as well among students, both of uh, the VET and uh, higher education. 
And you can see that uh, the risk is that 65% uh, of the secondary school students uh, want to go to work abroad and 50% of the university students as well. And uh, which is even, uh, it could be even positive because if you learn during a couple of years a lot of uh, new knowledge and uh, you may even uh, turn home that can be very useful but uh, what is more difficult that uh, a relatively high share of these uh, students uh, who come from the radiation year want to leave the sector 27 among the university students and 22 in the secondary school so thank you this was the presentation Thank you. Thank you, Lachos, for, for sharing. Um, very insightful. In the meanwhile, there have been some <coughs> reactions in the chat. Uh, there's one discussion on what businesses need um, to get started with uh, apprenticeships. Um, so maybe that's uh, something that you could comment on, what, what support uh, micro and, and small companies need to to get going. And uh, there was um, also a second question by Eleonore asking how successful you have been in uh, the dual training and, and what positions you offer. Uh, so, as we have all started, uh, our sector is an SME dominated sector. Uh, we also offer several other difficulties like the weekend and night uh, working hours. And uh, as the, the majority are uh, SMEs, they uh, they don't have the sources to handle this issue. It it can be financial, it can be HR, it can be the time, the mention, patience. Or they don't even have the knowledge to do it. Uh, so having this uh, set of uh, Accumulated crisis. Uh, they didn't act, but they uh, wanted to react. So the reaction was always uh, defense, firefighting. It was uh, shorter opening hours, uh, um, reduced menu card, or closing the pool or some other services in a hotel. And uh, this is not going in the good direction. So I think that uh, even if there is a, a set of uh, crisis uh, conditions and escape forward is always a better uh, action. So what we were trying to say, it was a convincing uh, process, educating the companies and uh, assisting them with the administration, uh, because using the apprenticeship means we are a people business. So if we have better people, then uh, with their new knowledge, for example, in the green area, uh, the companies can create a, a unique selling proposal. If they have this, then uh, they can obtain better prices. Uh, we also said that uh, actually uh, an employee uh, can produce, let's say, 100 uh, as a value added. If he upskills himself, uh, he may be able to deliver more. So the value added produced by him can be 120. And if you have that 20 more, it can be shared between employer and the employee. Therefore, we start to reduce uh, the salary gap and uh, uh, we can make additional developments in the company. So that would be the way uh, to go on. Uh, then from this uh, HR package, the companies had, have to learn and have to apply also a wonderful package for, the, uh, for retaining the talents. Uh, the big companies use it already uh, in a bigger manner, but it can be learned also for the small ones because if you pay more attention to your employee, you uh, value uh, advising that can always help and it can uh, come to a satisfied employee and uh, satisfied employee can mean that also the clients, the consumers will be uh, satisfied. Oh, the, the question was... If you can uh, the, the briefly comment on the dual, yeah. The, the dual education. 
I think Hungary is a very good example for the administrative uh, burdens, as it is relatively rigidly uh, organized and uh, um, the laws and the decrees that determine the your education uh, are not flexible enough. Therefore, a lot of uh, small companies don't dare to uh, use it. Uh, those who have the, the capacity for it, they are very happy because uh, if uh, you have an apprentice for a longer period, uh, then you can really teach him whatever is the uh, most appropriate in that working environment. And uh, you can also convince him that this is a positive environment. Uh, you can uh, make a career plan for that person and uh, you can plan the future. That's, a, that's an inspiring ending, ending remark. So. So thank you again, uh, Lajos. Um, now we will uh, turn to our next item on the agenda, which is uh, an exciting one. Um, we are uh, privileged to have with us uh, Dulan Venner, who I will just uh, quickly introduce. Um, Dulan is the president of the national section of the Best Apprentices of France, and um, he is a 20 three-year-old professional in the hospitality industry, industry uh, originally from Alsace in France. His uh, remarkable journey began in his teenage years uh, when he discovered his passion for the culinary world. And today, Dylan Werner continues his career in the um, gastronomical world as an apprentice um, for his master degree at the three-star Michelin-starred restaurant uh, Plenitude, located in the Cheval Le Blanc Hotel in Paris. So Dylan will now share us with us um, share with us his personal experience and achievements as an apprenticeship in the hospitality sector. So Dylan, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nicolas. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm very uh, happy to be uh, here today for this uh, important uh, day about the importance of uh, apprenticeship and uh, especially in the hospitality sector. Uh, I've started uh, my journey at uh, the age of 15 uh, in culinary, uh, but uh, I love to speak uh, too much, so I've changed to go to restaurant service. Uh, I worked in uh, multiple restaurants in France, uh, in Switzerland, and in other countries in Europe. Uh, and I've discovered uh, during my preparation for the Olympics a new job. It was the, my first year uh, as an apprentice in uh, politics and diplomacy in the protocol service of uh, Strasbourg city. And uh, uh, I've learned that apprenticeship, um, when you have some uh, luggage, you can go further to, when you're at school, uh, you have all those theories that are very important and uh, that uh, um, will help you in your future. But when you're in, uh, in apprenticeship, you will see the reality of it. You can demonstrate it. And for me, it's the best way to learn it. Uh, after that, uh, as Nicolas uh, have said it, I've joined uh, Paris, the capital city, uh, to work at uh, the uh, Hotel Cheval Blanc Paris, which is uh, part of LVMH Group, and in the three Michelin star restaurant called Plenitude uh, to finish my MBA. So uh, I'm very pleased to learn a uh, new thing every day and uh, for me, for my future, uh, to be uh, in this uh, excellence of, of apprenticeship is such a great um, place. And about that, I've done some competition, uh, like the World Skills. I'm the first French uh, champion in restaurant service. And uh, I've also done uh, in 2018 the uh, contest Best Apprentice of France, which is called Meilleur Apprenti de France. And uh, since to, uh, since few years now, I'm the president of the Best Apprentice of France. That is uh, 120 trades. And um, all of uh, those Best Apprentices of France, uh, it's more today than uh, 5,000 uh, of apprentices. For me, it was very important to highlight all those trades, all those skills, all those VET, uh, 
uh, that um, not everybody knows, uh, not everybody have a good image of it, uh, but most of them, uh, they are passionate people, they are passionate about what they are doing, uh, they earn their own money at the age of sometimes 16, 18, 20. Uh, they have a really career plan to do and they excel in that. And it's very important to say that uh, apprenticeship isn't just about getting a job. Uh, it's a journey that helps people to grow, uh, learn essential skills, as the other panelists just say before, and truly understand and craft. And um, I have also a message for you, all those participants that have this power to change things. Uh, it's that also the importance of supporting the next generation uh, by giving them the tools and the guidance uh, they need to succeed. Uh, because when you are 16, 18, you will only know like five or six uh, jobs that exist because uh, your family are doing that, but you don't know all the others. You don't know all the possibilities that you have. And for that, we need uh, to highlight all those uh, famous and passionate uh, skills. And uh, of course, hospitality, uh, I'm part uh, of, this, uh, of this sector, so uh, I'm very proud of it. Thank you. Thank you, Dylan. It's it's good to hear uh, from from a, a real apprentice, uh, so to speak. Uh, we often tend to speak at a high level, so it's it's good to have these uh, these these insights. Um, um, I I'm going to ask you a question very soon, but before I do that, I would like to launch a word cloud for our audience. So you, you keep yourself <laughs> self on, on, on your toes, so to speak. Um, we will go to the word cloud in a bit, uh, but in the meanwhile, I will ask uh, the question I had for you, Dylan. And that is a question that has come up several times today, and that is about the shortage and about how to attract um, young uh, apprentices to this industry. And you have touched uh, on it already that it might not be in the family and so on. But uh, I'm just curious to have her hear your, your take on this and maybe what you would say to someone who is considering apprenticeship, who is young, um why choose that and um maybe there is a green connection as well <laughs> yeah so, yes of course yeah. um first of all i think what we have a, a lake uh, of uh, showing uh, the importance of apprenticeship um all the time when you're at school uh, and when it's for you the time to choose where you want to go uh, it's all most of the time it's people that they have already done a career, but it's never the young people that they are speaking to others. Uh, and you know that uh, my generation, uh, and you were the same when you were all younger, uh, it's all the time easy for the oldest to speak about and to give you some lessons. But you also need to see uh, people around your age that uh, can succeed in that. Uh, that it is possible to do that, that it is possible. Uh, I was 22 when I became a world champion. It is possible uh, when you know where to go and uh, why are you doing that. And so it's important to speak about that at school, uh, to, show, uh, to show them when they are young as well. I think that Switzerland, it's a good example about uh, apprentices. And... Um, if someone is uh, questioning himself about doing that, uh, apprenticeship, uh, when you are in a, in a real enterprise, uh, it's not easy every day. Um, you need, you are in the real world, you are not at school anymore, uh, but um, you need to work hard. And when you work hard in those uh, trades, uh, you will succeed. Uh, there is not uh, a secret or just luck. You need to work hard, but you will see that by working hard at a young age, uh, you will grow faster than the others. And it is possible. Uh, I have a, a lot of uh, best apprentices of France that they are like 21, 23, and they have their own business now. Uh, but at the beginning, they work hard. And we ha also have to say to people, it is possible, but you need to work. Uh, you need to be well uh, accompanied uh, with the people of the profession, with your professors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but you have this possibility in your hands. And um, about uh, all the VET, I, I don't know if it's uh, on every European country, but uh, for the general public, uh, 
uh, VUT are still uh, not the good professional way to go uh, when you are at school. Uh, yes, you will do VUT because you uh, don't. You are not so good at school. That's not true uh, because uh, in all those VUT uh, trades, you need to be good at school also uh, to succeed because you will have this. Um, this uh, journey that you will work at school and also work in an apprenticeship. Uh, so you need to be good in the in both of them. So that's also important to say. And uh, when you have the passion, you will never seem uh, working. Uh, I'm working uh, in a three Michelin star restaurant in a palace hotel, which is uh, in the middle of Paris in the LVMH group, which is the number one in luxury. Uh, I have the pressure, of course, but it's my passion and I'm never working. I'm just uh, having fun every day. So it's possible. Well, really inspiring, Dylan. I think you could almost make a, a video to the pitch uh, apprenticeship, apprenticeships. And Thank it's you. also so true that if you are really passionate about something, then it's not uh, then it's not even work in a way. It's uh, you do what you what you love. Um, so um, ne next, um, I will ask uh, you do land it, and also the the other panelists to have a, a reaction on the uh, word cloud uh, before doing so I can quickly comment here um, so the question was uh, what are the most common challenges for apprenticeships in in the tourism and hospitality sectors and we see here um, awareness uh, as the the, the biggest one, uh, working conditions, uh, which which you mentioned, Dylan, can be quite favorable for those at young age. Um, I also see mismatch of skills, which Jiri mentioned earlier. So um, panelists, uh, without jumping at at one of you, I, I invite to to hear your your reaction on this on this word cloud. Maybe, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, well, um, our colleague Virginie said something really important that the employers need to understand that apprenticeship is not just labor, a uh, cheap labor force. It is the most important message that we need to set uh, so that also the people that would apply for apprenticeship will feel safe that they're getting part of their training in situ through apprenticeship, and they're not only being used. The biggest challenge that we are facing when we are trying to attract people in apprenticeship is their fear, their internal fear, that they're going to be mistreated, they're not going to learn enough, and they're going to be used as cheap labor force. So it is our duty to change the mentality on both sides, educate employee, employers, that this is part of their investment towards future good uh, staff, quality staff for their for their enterprises. And on the other side, convince and educate uh, learners that this is part of the procedure of being into the industry and having an actual career. Thank you. Yeah, indeed, we have sometimes had to change the image there, which is also aligned with the AFAS uh, mission to enhance the image of apprenticeships, that it's it's not cheap labor, indeed. Uh, Lajos, I see your uh, hand raised. Yes, uh, I have seen already examples that it's like, as I started with the football, that uh, acquire the talent uh, requests already some progress. So uh, there were uh, meetings in Hungary where the employers have uh, started to show their best. So it's practically applying all the modern <clears throat> methods to convince the children that we are the best place for you to learn and uh, to live and work and uh, uh, share your life with us. And uh, I think that it can be uh, a solution. It's a uh, a whole package because uh, if you want to be the best, you have to have the, the best people working uh, in your company. And therefore, it's a competition and a nice handling package. And uh, still one thing that uh, it's uh, more than the apprenticeship. 
I don't think there is only one, so there is one single solution that can resolve all the problems of the sector and of an employer. But definitely, uh, if uh, they apply uh, good upskilling, reskilling, uh, apprenticeship uh, uh, schedules, uh, this will definitely contribute to the improvement of the situation. So uh, even if step by step, uh, but we have to move in that direction. Thank you. Yes, yes, I, I, I agree. Um, Virgin, you had a has raised as well. Yes, um, ju just a, a few words because I think um, so to, to attract uh, young people, I think um, it, it was already said, but we really have to improve the image of the sector and to improve the image of the sector, we need to improve uh, wages, uh, working conditions to give career perspective. And I would just like to give a, an example uh, linked to the to the need uh, for a more sustainable tourism, um, the need for having green and uh, digital skills. Uh, because the, the German uh, social partner uh, they have uh, they have worked uh, on the, on the renovation of uh, of the modernization of the hospitality education system, uh, because they are, they have uh, they have seen the decline of uh, apprenticeship over the last uh, 20 years. And uh, it was a great work. Uh, so with with uh, with NGG and the Hoga, uh, and but also with experts in gastronomy, experts in cookery, experts in hotel trade, and also with the support, of course, of the of the education ministry. And um, the idea was really to 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 adapt uh, VET content to the future and create attractive professions uh, that offer young people opportunities on the labor market. And for example, there was a, a greater focus on uh, on sustainability. Sustainability was really part of uh, all jobs. I mean, it it was uh, it was uh, mentioned in all job profiles, uh, but also um, a focus on consumer protection, nutrition t uh, trends, teamwork. So, such uh, uh, transversal uh, skills uh, for all uh, profession in uh, in uh, in gastronomy and uh, in uh, in kitchen, but also in uh, in hotels. Um, and I think it 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 is very very important to look at this uh, kind of initiative really to make uh, uh, professions uh, in, in, in hospitality sector more attractive uh, by using the green and the necessary green and digital transition. That was my uh, my recommendation. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Virginie, for this uh, this comment at a, at a higher level as well. Um, it's it's very, very insightful. Um, I see that the, the time is, is, is flying by. Um, and so I think this is uh, this is a good point to to mark an end uh, of our discussion. We can of course continue the discussion. We have a we have a LinkedIn page which my colleague Ella kindly uh, shared in the in the chat. So I invite you to continue your your discussion discussion there. Um, so as a, as a final word, I would like to to thank all of you, of course, for coming here. I can say on a, on a personal note, uh, it was very rewarding to to moderate this um, this event, and also thank you to to my colleagues uh, at at the Commission and um, at ECRIS as well, who are, are have been working um, in the meanwhile as we have been speaking, um, and uh, we hope that it inspired those who are active in the tour tourism and hospitality ex ecosystem to take uh, take up initiatives to develop apprenticeships. And uh, we also uh, invite you to make a pledge um, on uh, for EAFA to, to further boost apprenticeships in the sector. It came up several times today that there is a shortage and there is a huge potential for the greening of apprenticeships in this area. So um, perhaps this could be a, a source of inspiration to, to take up a pledge and become an EAFA member and um, to, to also benefit from the, the networks that the Alliance bring. So um, yeah, finally, I would like to, to thank you again for your engagement and re very relevant questions. Uh, we look forward to welcome you, welcoming you at our next EAFA web webinar. Uh, again, do check out the LinkedIn page uh, to see more about our upcoming activities. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.